hear me okay? Great. Thanks, Kelsey. And thank you, Kelsey and the Ukiyo team for actually inviting us to be here and participate. It's uh, such a great opportunity. We've already been blown away with an amazing um, array of speakers this morning. And um, today, uh, so my name is Ivana. I'm from Australian Red Cross, where I work as a research and development manager of an initiative called Humanitech. And I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Kate. Hi. Um, is this working? Yeah, great. I'm Kate. So I work for Type Human, which is a consultancy which specialises in partnershiping with public interest technology companies. And so we've been working really closely with the Australian Red Cross for the past 12 to 18 months on this identity venture. And um, I'm the responsible for product at Type Human and the product manager on this project. So Kate and I uh, will be talking to you today about our identity project. But before we get uh, into the details of that, I just thought I'd give you a bit of information about the context from which the solution was actually um, developed and from which it emerged. So in 2018, sort of early last year, uh, Red Cross established Humanitech, which is a strategic initiative, which acts as a um, space for Red Cross to explore the intersection of emerging technologies and um, humanitarian action. And so it's a space for us, a bit of a hub, if you like, for collaboration with uh, sector and cross-sector partners to develop um, and test solutions and research in this space. And these um, types of projects that we're pursuing um, tend to be complex, tend to be common, and we're interested for them to make um, benefit uh, for the larger for-purpose community. So under Humanitech, just to illustrate how we're working, uh, we've partnered, for example, with Telstra Foundation last year. That's, um, Telstra is Australia's largest telecommunications company. And they're our partner for the next three years. And uh, their funding will largely be used to help us develop our so-called DoLab, so a platform to develop technological solutions from inception to um, scaling up uh, at a significant and hopefully um, fast collaborative way. We're also partnering as a major industry humanitarian partner with, uh, on a bid to develop a center of excellence on automated decision making and society. So this is a major research collaboration uh, across multiple universities and across sectors, which if successful will attract uh, more than $30 million of government funding and which will run from 2020 to 2027. So if you see me uh, popping champagne later in the week, because we will find out this week, you will know why, and please keep your fingers crossed. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea um, from about uh, the background. And so leveraging this humanity collaborative operating model, about 12 months ago, we started the identity project in partnership, so in collaboration with Type Human, as well as with partners from um, other major humanitarian organizations in Australia and uh, technology partners, universities, etc. This included, includes organizations such as Oxfam Australia, who I believe are here today. Um, and why we entered into this, there were a range of motivations that pushed us into the identity, thinking about identity, digital identity in particular. So um, as any good humanitarian organization, I think, uh, we um, do have a strategy, Strategy 2020, and under that strategy we developed um, a goal to mobilize more than two and a half million Australians to take humanitarian action. Now, um, we are aware that uh, the way people engage with social causes and uh, volunteering for social causes is changing. People are not necessarily interested in coming to Red Cross to work uh, with us for 10, 20 years as they used to, but they want to follow things that matter to them and they want to do it easily, they want to do it digitally. Um, so we realized that if we wanted to motivate those two and a half million Australians, we needed to remove barriers to engagement and to entry. Um, Internationally and quite severely, the sector, humanitarian sector, was also dealing with the aftermath of the Haiti sex, uh, sexual abuse uh, scandals. So in Australia, we had a major national review of that, uh, how the sector was responding uh, to those issues. And um, uh, the things that came out of that review were uh, pursuing a range of solutions, including um, social policy, but also technological solutions. So some things that were talked about were things like um, having digital ID for humanitarian workers, a sort of humanitarian passport. And then very practically, and something that kind of really sparked the action in terms of uh, putting the fire under this particular project, um, was that our, um, in April 2018, our recruitment solution provider 
um, which is a, a provider for many organizations across Australia, suffered a major privacy or data breach. So exposing uh, the details of many of our staff and volunteers uh, to potential privacy violations. So that was a serious uh, sort of um, push towards us thinking about, what well, can we do this better? Can we do this differently? Is there a way for us to create a system that um, reimagines trust in this digital sphere and actually reduces some of these complexities and reduces some of these risks? So, oh, sorry. So beyond that, we also realize there is an opportunity here because more broadly, what we're seeing is that um, Digital technologies are becoming increasingly uh, critical to people's ability to participate in social, civic and economic opportunities. In Australia, for example, there is an increased digitization of social services, so the government's access to government services such as aged care or um, your Medicare, which is a, a health insurance scheme payments or your dis disability care, you're increasingly pushed to um, do those by logging online and accessing your plans and accessing your money. And there's an increasing push also towards digital identity creation in Australia. And more broadly, we also realize that there's an opportunity to sort of unleash human potential if we could help work towards a solution that's value driven that could help uh, document the undocumented, so more than one billion people around the world who don't have access to um, their identity or pr provable, verifiable identity. So um, we realized that obviously there's a lot of organizations around the world that are trying to develop a digital identity, the so-called race towards solving this issue. Um, and we felt that there was an opportunity, as I said, to go uh, into this issue uh, from a value-driven proposition that is not seeking to either necessarily control or surve surveil people or uh, monetize um, their data. Um, so um, largely what we've seen is that uh, digital identity is either being developed by governments um, who are prioritizing the needs of their departments uh, over the needs of citizens. And uh, the other camp is obviously the um, businesses, banks and tech companies who are incentivized by commercial gain. Now to illustrate this point why this is important uh, coming from, from a social good perspective, um, if you think in Australia, for example, the government is trying to develop two digital identities at the moment. <laughs> one is through its MyGov port portal, and the other one is through the Australia Bank Digital Identity Solution. Now, at the same time, government has in, in, in Parliament currently legislation on facial recognition that will basically pull everyone's, all Australians' uh, driver's license data into a single database. Um, and this is also the same government that last year sort of subscribed the entire population to their um, My Health app, which was a digital database of your health records, and uh, it did so on the opt-out basis. So uh, what it means is that if you miss the deadline, you kind of by default had this um, app created for you. So it just kind of illustrates the layers of this um, cake that, if we're not careful, could lead to serious privacy concerns um, for people. So, what are we doing about it with our identity project? Um, we are trying to develop a truly decentralized self-sovereign identity ecosystem. And uh, what we're doing is, um, it's like a digital credentialing platform which will give people ownership of their own, their own identity and enable civic, social and economic participation. So we're starting by disrupting ourselves first, which means that we're testing with our staff and volunteers on a voluntary basis uh, before taking this approach to communities we work with. Yeah. And I'm gonna pass you over to Kate now. Yeah, thank you. So um, if you could just go back one slide, sorry. So I think this is really interesting, this reimagining trust in the digital age, enabling greater civic, social and economic participation. And this solution excites so many people because the amount of use cases are incredible. Um, and it's really easy to get quite overwhelmed and go quite wide. So when we say uh, social, we're talking about use cases like volunteering. So make it easy for me to volunteer. Typically right now with most large non-for-profit organisations, from the point of registering interest to actually vol volunteering, it takes three months in Australia which is just phenomenal. Um, when we talk about uh, 
uh, economic, we're talking about kind of the unbanked and making it easier. And one of our partners, for instance, uh, works with young women in the out of home care system. And literally once they kind of hit 18, they get given a bunch of paper documents in order to get a bank account and register for Centrelink. And typically most 18 year old uh, do not care about a bunch of documents. So they end up not getting a bank account and unable to receive payments. Um, and then uh, the kind of civic is around more uh, thinking about the gig economy and how the world is changing and how do uh, people build trust with one another in these gig type relationships. Um, so after, uh, in since February to uh, just really recently, we've built a pilot uh, a MVP product and, and done four pilots with, with 120 users going through the system over four different organisations. And these insights led us to some really, uh, really evolve and come to the pointy end of what it actually means to assert trust and prove who you are. Um, and in the volunteer use case, there's kind of these three tiers of trust. The first one being uh, the compliance tier, which is the national police check and the working with children check. So this is kind of the minimum bar to get in. Uh, and our original kind of hypothesis was that by making that easier, we could make it easier to participate. And actually what we found is there's a lot of people already doing that and they're actually not solving the pain point of the volunteers. They're just making the administration easier. So right now you can get a police check within two hours in Australia. So then what are the other hurdles? And it's more than just meeting the minimum bar in a lot of humanitarian organisations. It's about what training do you have? Um, so then we found this whole new level of credentialising training. So we think of the emergency services sector mm -hmm. and typically to become an emergency services volunteer with bushfires in Australia, you need at least uh, 10 specific trainings to work. And in a, in a massive disaster, it's really challenging to come onto site and show that you have those credentials to prove who you are and what you do. So it, the, the product has evolved into this double-sided credentialing marketing place where you can credentialise and assert who you are through the layers of compliance training and then moving on to the recognition. Um, so yeah, like I said, to date we've completed a minimum viable product, we've, comp we've completed multiple pilots and really important is the end utility with the users. So it needs to be something that I can go to any organisation in an emergency and I can demonstrate my skills and my trustworthiness. So it's really important that there is utility and that different organisations can recognise the different credentials, which um, Ivana will chat through the Trust Alliance. Um, cognizant of time, so I might just, yeah, this is just all about the, the core opportunity which enabled us to really land on the credentialing as a tool. And I'll just quickly chat through how it works. Um, would you mind skipping ahead? Thanks, Ivana. Yeah, so essentially what we've done is we've built a web application platform where organisations can go on and create their own account. That account, um, the actual creation of the account, is created through a smart contract using Ethereum. Now, the actual credentials themselves are not stored on the blockchain. It's the digital identity component that we have enabled with, with the product. So the product at its core is really 5 to 10% on the blockchain and the remainder 80% using the existing systems that companies have. So then they'll create an account, they'll ask individuals to they'll ask individuals to claim a training or a working with children or a police check. Um, some, in some cases, this will require an approval. Once that approval is received, the individual on their app, um, and we have an integration with Uport Wallet, then downloads their credentials onto their wallet, which then can be, they can share, and other non-for-profits or humanitarian organisations can request a copy of those verified credentials. Uh, yeah, so this is just chatting through everything we've done, and we're targeting a commercial market launch early in 2020. Thanks, Kate. So uh, this is the part that excites me. So in June 2019, we actually launched a Trust Alliance, which is a bit of a stakeholder forum or forum to bring these like-minded organisations together to work together on standards and design principles that uh, would enable this ubiquitous and useful, uh, good digital identity ecosystem to come to life. 
So you can see some of the founding members uh, illustrated there, but it kind of gives you a picture. We've got some major humanitarian organizations, we have community program organizations, a couple of universities who are interested in the product, particularly for their international student um, cohort, um, and uh, technology companies such as Type Human and the Telstra Foundation. Um, as part of this, we've got a couple of working groups um, working on interoperability, on thought leadership, on vision, mission, governance. So we're kind of working out um, the process of what this will look like um, for the long term as we speak. And we're keen to expand the alliance judiciously, so if you're keen to find out more, please do let us know. I will go through this very quickly. So given that we are trying to invest, um, attract uh, partners and investors into this project, we are um, uh, kind of looking, well, what are the opportunities? So we have kind of looked at the opportunities in terms of credentialing and the size of the market. Um, we've also looked at uh, some cost savings here. So we've extrapolated some figures based on the Australian volunteer market, looking at how much it costs to actually onboard a volunteer and how many um, people could be actually put through this. So we're looking at potential savings of half a billion Australian dollars um, and um, much more globally, obviously, if we succeed. Kat, do you want to talk a bit about the roadmap really yeah. quickly in the minute we've got left? Yeah, in the one minute. Yeah. So the, the rest of this year is really about nailing the ability to share credentials and um, the verifying process will be kind of governed through the Trust Alliance, which is a really exciting use case. Uh, then moving into 2020, testing some different pricing strategies to make sure uh, to test what is uh, makes this product a commercially viable product. Um, and working really closely with making sure supporting the community because it needs to be an open standard and we don't think this solution should be the only solution. It should just set the standard and make it easier for anyone to want to contribute to this network. Thanks, Kate. And uh, given the complexity of the product, we also are engaging advisory support across legal, technical, as well as connecting with the ID2020 who are sort of flying the flag on the issue of digital identity. So I think that's uh, all we've got time for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much.